Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Great Wall Street Hospital Grand Rounds. Um, my name is Jonathan Smith. I'm the uh, Deputy Director of Medical Education and a City Consultant. So, um, looking forward to our Grand Round today, uh, entitled Excel at the Excel, and we're going to look at the role of Great Wall Street staff had in setting up the Nightingale Hospital. Um, this can be requested some C CPD points as well, so the RCQCH, so you can self-credit this for an hour's worth of CPD, so one CPD point, um, and if you want a certificate, if you send us this feedback form, which the link is to afterwards, or you can get that via PGME, we can send you a feedback form um, if you put your name in there as well. Um, we're hoping to finish all the presentations by about half past 1.22, and then we'll give us 10, 15 minutes worth of questions at the end, uh, and we'll be finishing up at 2 o'clock promptly at most, okay, so we've got um, about 80 people online at the moment. Um, so what I think I'll do is I'll just go ahead and introduce Vicky. Ashley's going to be chairing the session on behalf of the uh, Nightingale team. Um, Vicky's the head of education in the GLA, um, but a lot of you probably know her from being an advanced practitioner on PRCU. Um, and she's also head of development of the postgraduate academic curriculum for the GLA at the moment. Um, so well and truly um, involved in education trust wide. Um, include nationally now. So Vicky, over to you. Hey, thank you, Jonathan. And um, thank you for inviting us to speak at Grand Rounds today. And I hope you can tell what I'm saying despite the mask. Um, so I've got a team of people with me here today to kind of reflect the kind of the varying places that um, Bosch staff helped um, and worked within the NHS Nightingale project. Um, for the first speaker that is going to be Jo, and I'll hand you over to Jo in, in a few minutes. Jo is an army nurse, and she's the commanding clinical officer, and so she will be talking about the army's um, role in the development of, of NHS Nightingale. Then I've got myself and Cathy Roberts with me over on one shoulder. <laughs> Cathy Roberts is the lead educator at CATS, and we were very much involved in the development of the education and training associated with NHS Nightingale. And then finally, on my other side, I've got um, Phil Dart, who's one of the anaesthetic registrars who works clinically on the um, shop floor. So hopefully you'll be able to get a sense of how GOSH was involved in kind of all aspects of the NHS Nightingale project. So the Army were there first. Um, they were the ones that kind of started the inception. So once the kind of the idea and um, had been and the location had been decided about, upon and anyone who was lucky enough to watch Risky Business and saw Matt's um, presentation at Risky Business um, a couple of weeks ago. We'll have kind of seen how the idea and the inception of, of the, the concept came up. And then, like I say, the army came in before um, we were um, invited onto site. So I'm going to hand you over to Jo and Jo will be able to introduce herself fully in her proper rank, et cetera, and talk about the army's role in the development. Vicky, thank you. I'm just going to share some slides. Um, so, Vicky, thank you very much. Um, by way of a quick background, most of you know me as, as one of the nurse practitioners here at Bosch, but I'm also a colonel in the British Army. And as uh, Vicky's already alluded to, I was um, asked from a military perspective, and I got a phone call actually on Mother's Day, to say pack your bags and, and get yourself to the, um, to the Excel. And I'm going to talk about a couple of things, really, um, this afternoon is, is first how the military supported our NHS colleagues and particularly the NHS Nightingale in the initial planning and setup of, of the uh, medical facility, but also our experiences on overseas operations and how we were to offer advice, in particular um, IPC staff welfare and mental health. And it was something that was very close to my heart. So, like a few of my colleagues, I was called um, on Mothering Sunday, and I think it was from Matt's office actually and was told, um, as I said, to, to, to get myself to the Excel where we we're going to set up a 4,000 bed intensive care unit. And the military, to some degree, are familiar with setting up medical facilities in hostile environments. Um, I've set up a tented hospital in the desert and operating a theatre in the park. And our current processes and procedures um, and the sort of thinking outside the box could easily be adapted to support such a project. And albeit sort of 100 times bigger than that we would be normally used to, but it was still a sort of battlefield and the timelines and working to try and keep ahead of the enemy, but in this case the enemy was a virus. Um, so if any of you have been to the Excel, um, it's essentially a kilometre long conference centre with a spine down the middle with cafes and meeting points and that was really to be our command and logistic hub. 
and either side of the huge conference spaces, we would hold 2,000 beds. And, and, and really the pace and the scale was unprecedented and like we've never seen before. And to be honest, the Excel in many ways was very suitable and really went beyond the functional characteristics of the sheer size of the building. And as you can see on the picture, um, it had local transport links, it had rows in and out and, and, and to support this massive um, logistical headache of building equipment. We had city airport opposite where um, we had a helipad. And of course we had hotels where we could support staff with accommodation. And as you can see on the picture, you can see the ambulance bays and, and, the, and the sheer size of this project. But more importantly, we could secure the building. And that was really important. So this, as you imagine, it was a huge sort of media interest in this project. It was amazing. And you'll be amazed how much sort of interest was in this project and people trying to get it in. Um, we were also going to be um, asking staff to work in an environment that was alien and high risk. And so it was essential that we built safety and support um, into all the things that we did. And finally, perhaps more importantly, was maintaining humanity and personalisation. And as you know, the Nightingale was to support um, London and save as many lives as possible and to do this as safely and as, 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 as compassionately as we could, given the circumstances. And huge challenges that this brought as well and the sheer scale and speed at which it had to be built was, was quite breathtaking, something that I've never experienced before. And I remember standing in the space and thinking, you know, crikey, how are we actually going to do this? Um, and it took a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of working with other colleagues to think how do we turn this into a hospital. Our overall priority was to support staff and to make this high risk sort of clinical um, model as safe as possible. And essentially we used task based competencies and adapted our military SAPs and created a one page reference booklet, which was really useful. You know, you cannot ask people to, to go through reams and reams of um, clinical guidelines. So this was a, a great thing that we adapted and coupled with an education program and Vicky will be speaking um, about that a little bit later. So the cubicles essentially were built from exhibition, um, exhibition displays and you'll notice that cobbled different patterns of flooring um, but when you're in a rush whatever you'll take what is going um, and it was something to see the miles and miles of tubing you know, and, and cables across the floor, and we had over 100 electricians at one point on site, um, some of them from the Gurkha Regiment. And the build was completed in about nine days, and it was a mix of military, NHS, contractors, architects, um, an ambitious task, some might say, but it clearly demonstrates that the impossible is sometimes possible with the right attitude and staff. So a common strategy that we use in the army, and it's known, uh, known as a rehearsal concept drill, and it's called the rock drill for short, and it essentially uh, provides that preparation, that risk assessment to manage those people in the field. But obviously we were managing a conference center. A couple of days before we opened, we taped out, as you can see in the picture, we taped out the, the, the basic flow um, and the design of the hospital. Um, and it looked at, changing or developing and we looked at the patient flow going through and we reviewed the things that we were doing we tested um, certain things and it was very obvious that some things that we assumed other people had done actually weren't done so it was really useful um, in, in putting this together to review what we're doing and it certainly went a long way to save a lot of time costs and potential problems um, initially there was a distinct lack of clarity at national level regarding infectious um, precautions. So we very quickly involved our REF um, IPC lead, where we had to risk and assess and adapt practices very, very quickly. After all, as I said, we were in a conference centre and we had to build donning and doffing levels. Moral courage, really, and something that the army is, is, is pretty used to, making decisions quickly without necessarily all the information. Um, but we needed very clear processes and procedures and a very quick way of disseminating it. Um, simple things like, you can see the picture on the left, uh, where we put sort of um, sticky tape uh, where we could easily identify roles. So certain tapes meant consultant, ITU, other tapes meant, you know, you were, whatever, you know, we had a mix of ophthalmology consultant. 
Um, and a lot of our practices in IPC were taken very much from our experiences in Sierra Leone during the Ebola crisis. But what was clear that practices had to be safe, clear, and consistent. So the military also, support, also supported and influenced the mental health and well-being. People really are our key assets and most will excel. But the experience may break some um, and we, we have to accept that. And we were very aware of the mental health challenges that would be heightened, risks of moral injury, um, which is a term derived by the British Army, where one feels unprepared and where actions and inactions challenge our ethical um, codes. And it's particularly prevalent um, in psychologically and physically ill-prepared, inexperienced, poorly suited people. And for us, that was our, one of our biggest challenges, really, as we didn't know the people who were coming to work at the Nightingale. We had no idea of previous experiences, abilities, and they will be working in, in areas um, that they were not used to or trained for. And of course, we were working in an unfamiliar environment, i.e. a conference centre, and I think you know, the first time I walked in there and saw the size of this place, it, it, it took my breath away as well. And I think working in this sort of environment, it would, it would uh, you know, find people questioning their, their competency and their ability, um, and this would exacerbate the risk of moral injury. So it was something that we had to get right and needed to put on the ground as quickly as we could. And, and and we also were very careful about non-medical staff, although we had clinical staff, we also had, you know, people that worked in the hospitality um, environments and, and cabin crew. So we were very careful that we did not expose them to uh, some of the clinical environments. So the Nightingale Mental Health Programme was very much multi-layered and, that, and that's really how we operate in the military. And it's about preparing people for the role ahead. Um, we didn't sugarcoat it, it was very clear what staff would face, uh, the psychological PPE, which was uh, set up at induction, uh, at induction, which would help individuals manage their own sort of mental health well-being and their own strategies um, of coping. And that was really, really important. And this is something we deliver to all of our troops prior to deploying. It's called the ACT mental health training. We had those very frank and very honest conversations about people, about role suitability asking people to look at their own vulnerabilities and, and take their own personal life responsibilities into account as well. And a few people did pull out at this point and, and, and that was absolutely fine. We encouraged our staff to buddy up. Um, and again, it's a concept within the army um, that, that we really did push um, and that people can keep a watchful eye over each other. Um, we mustn't mix this up with, with, with debriefing, but it was a way of just chatting after a shift about things that went well, didn't go so well. We can identify, you know, early signs of distress. We also had welfare walkers, which are our cabin crew colleagues, and we gave them a mix of both REACT and TRIM training. And TRIM training is a program developed by the military that looks at the, uh, at the awareness and the early effects of mental health issues, but also it allows you to have that sort of psychological savvy conversation. And our ethos, ethos at the Nightingale was very much nipping things in the bud. Information was readily available, and I think that's, that's pretty obvious across even NHS trusts. We did posters about current, um, we said we did about encouraging that two-way um, interaction. Um, giving staff an opportunity to have a voice, and that was really important, to a voice that was listened to and that was acted upon. Um, and we used an app called the uh, Improver app, and I think we could easily use that in the NHS trusts, and it was a way that we could monitor morale, but also, as I say, to have that two-way interaction. And the message, as you see in one of the pictures, is it's okay not to be okay. And demedicalizing that response um, of, of stresses and anxiety that people are finding. And we found that people excelled in this environment um, and had that sort of psychological growth. Um, we incorporated mental health into everything. And it almost became part of our normal day. You know, the stigma of, of mental health training and, and activities pretty much went. And we used the PIES model, and it's all about proximity, immediacy, expectancy, and simplicity. And it does exactly what it says on the tin. It was encouraging people to seek help early and to stay on the front line. Um, the Nightingale promoted very visible 
compassionate leadership. And here you can see a series of pictures within the clinical environment of ITEL. And, and a lot of people always say to me, oh, crikey, it actually looks like an ITU. And, and of course it does. Um, but we, we promoted visible and compassionate leadership um, with effective two-way communications. And it was really critical that we uh, involve users to inform what needs to change at a simple level and then take their ideas to adapt things. And we facilitated this in daily welfare hubs. Um, we developed a new role called the bedside learning coordinator, which is very much like our trauma nurse coordinator. Oh, we, um, the, uh, what they did is they collected data within the clinical arena on SIs and risks, and they offered that immediate um, coordination liaison with our quality and learning team and our, and our governance team. So we could immediately improve safety and practices. And, and it went a really long way um, to case sense of worth um, and belonging, validating those swift decision making uh, based on mutual respect and, and trust rather than singular decision making was, was, was always encouraged. Um, those that did engage on the app had some great ideas um, that arranged from sort of clocks in the clinical area and one of the doctors saying that, you know, rows and rows of beds was really quite unnerving. Um, and it was like slightly ventilated in the bodies. Um, so we developed what matters to me posters. Um, and we collected data from our family liaison teams when they spoke to the families and we placed them at the patient's bed. Um, and the report back to me that it was the single most initiative in humanising what could have been a dehumanising process. Uh, the pictures that you see now on the screen, the military has a simulation um, hospital where anyone that deploys goes um, for almost like a desensitisation. So we can run through simulation getting used to SOPs, equipment, daily routines and challenges. And, and right at the end, before we shut, we developed a program or the education team developed a program called the Zero Day. So it fought the, the, the nurses, doctors, clinicians and the, the, the volunteers and the clinical support workers into the environment. So they didn't get that sort of draw of, of, of breath when they first walked into the, um, to the real thing. Um, so, so in summary, really, for me, although the Nightingale was not in, uh, was not operating for, for a long period of time, it followed evidence and provides a really useful blueprint for how future rapidly established healthcare facilities might support staff carrying out essential, high, highly challenging tasks in the year ahead. And for me, the, the, the true measure of leadership is the ability to confront and support the anxiety of people at the time. And I believe we managed that in a short space. Uh, the care and compassion that was embedded into this extraordinary logistical challenge and the compassionate leadership, I hope is something that stays with us as we move forward. And if I could sort of drill it down to one concept, it's really quite simple. It was about kindness and supporting each other. So thank you very much for listening and I'm going to hand you back to Vicky. Okay, thanks very much, Joe, um, for kind of um, talking us through the army response. Um, so Cathy and I are going to talk through um, how we worked within the education and training team at the Nightingale Hospital. So as um, Jonathan said earlier, I'm one of the heads of education here, and Cathy is the lead educator at um, CATS. Okay, so um, the education and training team, we, all ca we came together on the 24th of March, um, I actually got a phone call about half past nine at night from um, my manager, Lynn Shields, on the 23rd, as we were all just watching the news around um, lockdown saying, would you be able to get to KPMG tomorrow morning for 9.30? We've been approached by Health Education England for support around putting together an education and training programme for um, the, um, what was at that time called Project Nightingale. <clears throat> there was 10 of us that came together, there's only eight of us in this picture. And um, we were a mixture of clinicians, academics, nurses, medics, and AHPs. So we very much represented kind of across the strata. And we also had corporate representation in there as well. Early on in the process, um, I realized we were going to need the right people at the right time. And quite early on, so you can see by 10.30 on the first day, I was already um, texting um, my manager, Lynn, um, to um, find out if Kathy Roberts could be released, which is how Kathy became involved in this project, because it was very obvious very early on that the right people at the right time were going to be key in making this project a um, success. So what were we asked to do? So it was kind of 
to, to a certain extent, it was almost how not to put together a curriculum. So I've been involved in writing various curriculum in both in higher education institutes and within the Gosh Learning Academy here. And this was almost an example of how not to do it. We were given three days to design and deliver a multi-professional education and training programme to, to staff that were going to be working in the hospital. We needed that programme to be able to train um, between 3,000 and 1,000 volunteers every day. So as well as writing this programme against roles that weren't fully defined for a job that wasn't fully defined, we had to do this at scale, at pace and deliver within three to five days. So the brief was big. So the team, first thing we did was split ourselves up into teams. And um, because of my clinical background, I was um, myself and a man called Clinton John, who is the head of clinical education at UCLH. We worked together on simulation and clinical skills. And this is the team that we, I brought Kathy into. <clears throat> you can see around the simulation and clinical skills, there were many other streams that we um, focused on. So we had the human resources aspect because we did need that corporate um, input as well. We had academics working on curriculum and content, so there was a lot of online learning and teams were, um, volunteers were expected to do a lot of online learning before they turned up for their education. We had teams working on workforce modelling, that was a challenge for that team, um, it was a moving feat. The roles that were as imagined on the first day, on the 24th, were very different to the roles that we eventually got to towards the end of um, the tenure of um, NHS Nightingale. And we also needed developing, um, we needed to develop a faculty. There was eight of, eight of us that were actually educators in the room on the first day. There was no way we were going to be able to educate a thousand people every day over a period of time. So the first thing we wanted to do was design the curriculum. Now we had one day um, with these people and with, there was a variety of different roles and we stratified um, the curriculum that was designed against your role. So you're either a green, an amber, or a red. So a green is someone who basically has the skill set that they need to do their job. So these were anaesthetic registrars, ICU registrars, ICU nurses, um, ICU consultants. It was a bit someone who basically just needed to kind of have some familiarization around the, the environment and the equipment, and then they would be good to go. You had your ambers. This would, you know, would probably be a ward nurse or a non-ICU doctors um, working in a IC role. So we had a lot of people coming from places like Moorfields, or ophthalmologists who uh, were counted as ambers because they were medics, they just needed some additional skills. And then we had our red people and these were the people who were new to healthcare. And we had quite a lot of these, especially towards the end. Um, a lot of, um, as Joe's already mentioned, we had a lot of cabin crew coming through because they have a lot of the skills that are needed to work in healthcare. You know, they've got communication skills, they've got people skills. These are people who are used to you know, dealing with um, people on planes. So um, they have some basic first aid, so that they were um, stratified as red. Our idea was, um, when we designed the curriculum, was around familiarization rather than education. We had one day. Half that day was the corporate inter um, work that needed to be done around um, go clinical governance, et cetera. So really we had half, kind of half a day really to do a simulation and um, make you familiar, familiar with the environment you were going to be in. We didn't expect you to walk out with new skills that you didn't walk in with. I wasn't going to teach you how to put a central line in, I wasn't going to teach you how to wean a ventilation. You left with the same skill set, but we hoped that you would be familiar with the environment and how it was going to be done in um, NHS Nightingale. We were looking for confidence rather than competence at this stage because we didn't test competence. We didn't have the time or the facility to do that. Um, the, that was tested on the, on the shop floor when you were actually there working. We just wanted to give you the confidence to be able to walk into that environment. And as Joe was talking about earlier on, there was a significant focus on what we termed psychological PPE. So you obviously had training on how to put um, actual physical PPE on, but we had a big focus on psychological PPE around resilience and how do you deal with working in an alien environment um, against potential in a potentially alien role and working against about something that you don't really know um, the environment. So that was, a, that was a massive part of the training as well. And it was always really, really well evaluated the psychological PPE section. So we had a really strong faculty. Um, everybody had lots of strong ideas, strong opinions. Um, 
we did drive each other crazy. We had lots of heated discussions in the very beginning because we were all trying to come to some sort of common goal. But because we did have that goal, we were able to um, agree and compromise where needed. And I think the main thing was that we had to be really pragmatic. This wasn't the time to aim for perfection because we clearly couldn't achieve that with such a short time scale. We had a really strong leadership model, and this is something that really resonated with me because it was just, it was amazing from the get-go. So the leaders were very much had the expectations that you would complete the task you were allocated to do and fulfill your objectives. And you only really reported back to them if you had a problem. They were very responsive and they're really, really receptive to ideas. So at the end of the first day of the um, our first induction program, um, the volunteers who were from um, the team Team London. Yes, yeah, so we had a whole heap of volunteers that were part of the legacy from 2012. So the volunteers that helped out at the, at the Olympic Park, they came with us to the edu our various education centres and worked with us um, to help. Um, direct candidates around yeah. the training. So basically at the end of the first day of induction, I kind of reflected on the role that the volunteers had given the fact they were volunteering their own time and energy to do this. They were just stood outside of all the classrooms for the entire day, which I didn't think would be particularly fulfilling to them. And we were relying on their goodwill to come back every day and who had to support us through this process. So after discussing with them, I decided to um, approach the leadership team in one of our faculty meetings to use the volunteers as tour guides for, for the induction process. So each volunteer or each two volunteers would be in charge of one group and would follow them through induction. So the fact that they were all in it together, they could keep an eye on them, make sure nobody got lost in between classrooms. Excuse me. They could encourage um, good social distancing and they all the volunteers had um, alcohol gel in terms of maintaining hand hygiene as well. And a key thing really to the volunteers um, taking on this role, they felt really engaged in that process and they really felt like part of the team. And I think that was really important. And it also really helped with the flow of the candidates through the um, up and down that really long corridor, which you can see it was quite narrow. Not yet, because we haven't shown the photos. <laughs> Joe has. <laughs> um, and I think one of the other things was with working with uncertainty and we were really in a constant state of flux throughout. So you had to be people who really thrive in those sorts of unpredictable environments. And my background working within CATS is that we can be in a different environment a couple of times a day. So you just have to get on with it as best you can with the things that you've got at that time. So there was these changing clinical and workforce models. So we were adapting the programme sometimes on a daily basis, and that was quite a challenge. And I think for the leaders as well, our um, leadership team, it was quite difficult to balance the pure educationists who wanted everything to be done perfect asking what type of learning theory was, was I, you planning to use and people like myself and Vicky who were dealing with actually let's just get the job done today and we'll figure out those sorts of things later on so it was trying to get that balance and it was quite difficult and we were trying to be responsive to the clinical needs so once these people had started working in the Nightingale Hospital if issues have been identified we were able to adapt our induction program in accordance with that. So um, where did the training happen? So it had to be on site because we wanted to do in situ, in situ simulation um, as well as in the education centre. So we were at the Nightingale Hospital out at Excel. More specifically, we were kind of tucked around the corner in, the com in one of the smaller conference centres, um, Centre Ed, and this is where all our education and training went on. And Cathy just mentioned the corridor. So this is our education centre. This is where, at our first location. So it was 0.8 of a kilometre from one end of the corridor to the other. And we walked up there so many times a day. Not once did Cathy and I do less than 20,000 steps um, a day when we were working there. And that you can see we had, you know, one of the challenges we had in the education centre was just around moving people around. We've got about, we have between 300 and 1,000 people coming through. And we would, the people would be walking up and down these corridors. And so we had to kind of try and utilize um, up one way and down the other. So the challenges weren't just around the education process. It was actually just the actual logistics of how are we going to get people about. Um, we had to make this into a full immersion simulation. So we had very high standards around what we wanted to do with the simulation. Um, this was the only chance we had to do this with people. It's the only opportunity we had for them to actually practice 
And it was our only opportunity to have any kind of assessment of skills. We didn't formally assess. If we found someone who clearly wasn't right for the role, we were able to pull them to one side and redirect their training or get them to think about um, other education that they could do. This was our simulation. This is what we turned into our simulation lab. We had to be creative. There was no equipment. Um, we had um, very little um, equipment in the simulation lab. Um, there was very little equipment in the hospital at this stage, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, well, the first few simulation day, first few education days that we did, they only had two or three ventilators in the, in the actual hospital. There was nothing that they could spare to us. So we were being incredibly creative, as you can see. So um, luckily I came, I was, um, had my car, so I drove back to Pats on, on the second day, raided all our training cupboards, and PICU also very kindly um, gave us some stuff for the training. So we were able to have at least some of the basic consumables that we needed to make the training as, as realistic as, as we could at that stage. But um, we did have some photographs of the syringe drivers because we didn't have the real ones to show and again for the ventilators. And obviously that did get better as time uh, progressed. So we, but we tried from the very start to do the very best we could with the minimum amount of equipment and kit that we did have. And then just as we were getting settled, Vicky chose to have a couple of days off, which was um, good for her, but um, I was then asked to um, go and visit the O2 with a plan to have a floor plan designed for the education centre by 10 o'clock that evening. Um, for those of you that know me would clearly know that something like that is not one of my strong points. So after a mild panic, um, I went back to the basics of every educationalist or practice educator and I did a PowerPoint presentation. So I managed to think about how we wanted the training, uh, the simulation and the clinical skills to look like. And what we wanted that to be was an accurate reflection of the actual clinical floor in the Nightingale Hospital. So we got the, um, the Olivia, the Olivia Octavia mm -hmm. from the O2 and her team, and they built um, these cubicles, which would actually mirror what it looked like in the hospital. So you can see with the photograph on the right there, we're able to maintain social distancing as well, because that was really important for all of us. So people could have um, spaces in between the skill stations and in the, for them, the actual debriefs as well. And we did have really high fidelity simulation mannequins, some anaesthetic machines there, and we prioritised the green groups, so the people who already had intensive care skills, we prioritised them to have the really high fidelity simulations for them to get the most out of it. So we also taught clinical skills um, in some of the most bizarre places I've ever taught clinical skills <laughs> in my life. And um, so these are some of our skill stations. Oh, um, so they are we we had skill stations in the boxes at the O2. So in the bottom left hand corner, that's in um, one of the executive boxes. What you can't see is there is a bar, but unfortunately the ball the bar was unstocked before we were allowed into the rooms. Um, the top left hand um, skill station there, that was um, just in a corridor. There's a burger bar just opposite it, um, that, that bed. We were everywhere. Um, so we had to make the most of the space that we had and the opportunities that we had. So were we successful? Well, it's hard to know at this stage. We were certainly incredibly well evaluated. Everybody who, did, who undertook the training highly rated it. Um, there was lots of commendations on Twitter. People would stop us. It was the best hospital induction ever. And they learned what we actually needed to know. And this is what we wanted to hear. And this is what we were aiming for. Some of the people who came in, so the red people who were new to healthcare, and they actually wanted to go on and pursue a career in nursing after um, undertaking our training and doing some simulation. So that was really good because it's good to know that there is going to be some sort of legacy from this because obviously we have a workforce crisis going forward. That was just kind of on the spot evaluation though. So we needed something slightly more um, formal and that, pro that process is still um, ongoing. So there's a team of academics from the medical school at um, Queen Mary's University London. They're doing a formal evaluation um, pro process. And they're contacting people who've worked there with questionnaires and just to look at what, what the effect was. The actual faculty team themselves are also um, there. There's been a lot of research done and we're expecting about five or six papers to come out of um, the work that was done there. So there is, there is a bit of a legacy going forward and there are lessons to be learned. 
Um, all the resources that we designed, and Kathy kind of um, talks about that kind of briefly. We kind of, you know, people want, some people want to know what learning theory we were using. Well, that's the kind of thing we went back and we filled in. We had the training, we developed it. We went back and we filled in those gaps once we were up and running. All, those, all that work is done, the curriculum is written, the lesson plans are all available and they are all online. We, had, we were the first um, Nightingale Hospital in the, in the country and we had many calls from other Nightingale Hospitals as they were being de um, developed across the UK. Um, so we've, um, we've sourced all our, our resources together in one place so that people can find them and they can be utilised. There's no point reinventing the wheel. So in terms of our learning, um, for me, um, the, the big thing is that nothing is impossible. And I think that's what um, Jo said in one of the phrases Jo used in her presentation. As I said earlier on, it's almost a, an, a model of how not to design a curriculum, um, to do it on such a large scale so quickly with a team that doesn't know each other, for um, unclear job roles with unclear learning objectives. But we work together as a team and we have strong leadership and we achieved it and we i feel we did really well the initial evaluation is that we did really well so nothing is impossible so then we've sort of looked at because the evaluations were so good is this something that we could um, reflect on and think about could we adapt our own trust induction because it was done there in, you know in a one long day process and now since with covid we've all taken to technology to whole new levels so is this something we can think about reducing the hospital induction to maybe um, streamline it slightly to encourage you know more clinical um, more inductions on the clinical floor and actually getting people into the workplace quicker and um, we got rid of all the normal processes because they were not useful we were dynamic and we were flexible yeah and um, this was like my reflection that i sent to the leadership team on my last day and it was just like a few key words really that summed up my experience so teamwork makes the dream work it was challenging we were challenging we were responsive all the comments that you can see up there uh, we were exasperating and I, I definitely know i was um but it was it was a really brilliant brilliant experience um so that's where our journey ends we did the education and we did the training so i'm now going to hand you over to phil dart he's one of our anesthetic sbrs here and he actually went out there on the shop floor and did the work as I've actually delivered. So I will hand you over to Phil. Yeah, hi, I'm, uh, I'm one of the registrars in anesthesia here, and I was seconded briefly to the uh, Nightingale for a couple of weeks. Um, I was one of many uh, GOSH staff who went across to the Nightingale, and I certainly wasn't the one who was there uh, the longest or had uh, the biggest role. Uh, so if there's anybody else um, on the Zoom call who'd like to add in the comments or questions on Slido, at the end, that'd be fantastic to share their experiences as well. Um, so to go back to my role in the Excel, it started uh, back in March. Um, the anaesthetic department, as with uh, the rest of the hospital, was a bit unclear on what the burden of paediatric disease were, uh, were going to have with COVID. So there was um, initially we were put onto a resilience rota uh, and we looked to see how we could support other specialties, especially critical care for projected uh, influx of patients into PP beds. Um, so the anaesthetic department gave around eight of the regs to uh, the ICU department, uh, and then some more went to CATS, and the remaining registrars on that, and some also went um, and developed the adult transfer um, service for London, which is a fantastic amount of work on their part. Uh, the remaining registrars that were left in anaesthetics were on a resilience rota and doing uh, relatively few shifts because we wanted to maintain uh, a buffer capacity to have uh, up to sort of 30 percent sick was the projection with the covid uh, disease so the, the registrars that were left found that we were getting a bit frustrated we weren't perhaps um, doing as many shifts as we might like so one of the things the department were really good at um, getting on the front foot and looking to do is to see whether we might be useful to grow across to other locations within london uh, who may need more um, support so um, consultants and registrars from uh, Great Ormond Street went across to several centres in London uh, and I went to the Nightingale. Um, so as we, a lot of us, I think we would have seen emails going at the start of March saying, uh, please don't apply for the Nightingale. The Nightingale has plenty of staff um, and we don't need any more volunteers. So I'd kind of uh, not considered it uh, from that point of view. But I spoke to a friend of mine, Rob Broomhead, who was the lead for anaesthesia at the Excel. He's a consultant from King's. 
Um, and he said that really wasn't the case for anesthesia and they were really looking for people. So I spoke to um, my team in anesthesia and with, with HR, um, they were very quick to push through and very supportive of um, letting me go out there. Uh, unfortunately, the HR at uh, the Excel Centre um, was brand new and had a lot of teething trouble. So my from the point where I was released by Gold Command to go across there to the point where I was actually accepted by the Excel to start work was about eight or nine days. So it was quite a long delay in getting across. Um, in terms of the Excel Centre, Joe's spoken about it quite a lot. Um, and I think I would just echo that sentiment of it was unbelievably vast. The, the, it was probably the biggest room I've ever been in my life. You walk in and it's a kilometre long. Um, so people often say, you know, it was, was it quite quiet? There was only 40 patients and so on. Well, if you think of um, a big busy ICU would be sort of 20 beds uh, typically in London. So if you have two big busy ICUs next to each other, it was a big busy uh, ward, but it was in the middle of a room that was a kilometre long. So it was just this sort of bizarre... Um, contrast. Uh, one of the sort of upshots of that is you, you know you try and be five minutes early for work, uh, you get to the front door of the Excel Center, uh, five minutes early to work and it's 15 minutes more walk to get to the other end to get into uh, the ICU. Um, in terms of roles, the, the basic split was there was two ICU consultants per day uh, and two senior ICU nurses uh, and then there was usually two anesthetists who were part of the sort of around the airway specific jobs uh, two to three critical care doctors, a team of ODPs, and then usually one ICU nurse per four, four to six patients, depending on who they could get available, uh, and then one nurse per bed space who may be an RN from a different um, subspecialty, and then usually a doctor uh, between one every two to four patients, again, depending on the availability. And then there's a whole raft of um, auxiliary teams, so medical scientists, there was uh, an entire laboratory made at the um, Excel. There's an imaging department with CT um, um, and physiotherapists and probably all sorts of people that I'm forgetting to mention. I apologize for that. Um, in terms of role allocations, there was four um, specific teams um, per day. So there was a Lions team, a proning team, an arrest team, uh, and a transfer team. Uh, and the personnel in those, those teams sort of um, was fairly dynamic. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was interesting. You have people there who were just all, the, all day long, they'd be turning patients one way to the other. I remember one day one was a professor of ophthalmology from Moorfield, for example. There's a lot of people pitching in who had really interesting different um, skills bases and, and, um, and jobs. Uh, in terms of the utilities at the centre, so it was amazing what was created in such a short, short time. There was electricity to every bed side, there was um, pipe gas to every, um, to every bed. I believe they put in two um, of the big vacuum uh, oxygen containers, I forget the uh, VOCs were, 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 uh, were built at the, at the Excel in really short notice. Um, there was, however, no running water uh, in the Excel. So every, between every patient, uh, you were using alcohol hand gel um, and you were obviously in PP the whole time. There was the ability, there was ventilators. So there was, um, there was six critical care ventilators and then the rest were uh, Penlon anesthetic machines. So for those not, uh, critical care familiar it's kind of a bit like um having a smartphone versus a top of the line uh, pc the, the anesthetic ventilators were by no means basic kit they're very good they're very um, practical very high tech but they didn't compare to the um the icu specific ventilators which were a much higher quality so there was a bit of rationing there the drager ventilators would go to the sickest patients and the rest of the patients would go onto anesthetic machines um, there was renal replacement um, therapy available um, only in two bed spaces um, and then unlike a normal uh, critical care you'd run um, continuous uh, uh, modes of um, renal replacement therapy like CVVHF. These were all intermittent hemodialysis which wasn't ideal um, and is slightly more associated with hemodynamic compromise but um, actually we had, uh, we had RRT specific nurse specialists who were running them and they had um, very little problem with that. And I think that was sort of a lot around their hard work and their diligence looking after the patients taking their uh, intermittent hemodialysis. Um, there, was, there was talk about, and I think there was initially, or they, they made some initial steps towards designing a theatre. So there was going to be a tracheostomy theatre, which uh, actually didn't come to fruition before um, the shutting of the centre. 
uh, and there was um, surgical cover and a, a sort of allied um, uh, medical team cover provided by UC Barts Health. So, for example, there'd be a urologist who would be on call from Barts and, and so on, general surgeon. Um, in terms of uh, specific challenges, it was incredibly noisy. It's a bit like being in a like an aircraft hangar or something with the constant whirring, or like being in an aeroplane, that constant sort of background humming. Um, you had full PPE all day, uh, which I think in anaesthetics we wear it for every case, but we certainly get breaks in between cases to take it off. Whereas um, this was, a, you know, full shift in PPE, and I was I kind of hadn't anticipated how hot and like sweaty and uncomfortable, and how much the sort of the um, FFP3 cut into your head and get really uncomfortable after a while. So. A lot of the discomfort was sort of purely physical in terms of working there. Um, it was very difficult to communicate with the noise. Um, and as I say, there was, there was some uh, clinical stuff that you'd like to have been there that wasn't available. Um, just to say briefly about the disease itself, I, um, I was really surprised um, and quite shocked at how sick these patients were. And perhaps that's a bit naive on my part, but these were supposed to be the easiest of the London COVID patients, the um, patients without comorbidities with single organ failure and just respiratory failure. And they were super sick. They uh, almost to a man had um, thrombotic complications. Nearly everybody had, uh, was uh, thrombophilic and had uh, either PEs or, or distal clots uh, or raised um, D dimers and so on. They all had refractory ARDS. Um, they were all being proned and intermittently on um, advanced uh, ICU ventilatory modes like uh, APRV and so on. And a lot of them ended up going on to ECMO. So I was, yeah, I was a bit shocked at how sick these patients were. There was, I think, of, of, of the, the shifts that I did over two weeks, there was probably three arrests and multiple deaths. Um, so, yeah, it was striking just how sick people were getting with COVID. Um, the Nightingale also was part of the research across London, so part of the recovery study, which has uh, yielded these results today, the dexamethasone. Uh, so hopefully that's you know, an important takeaway that um, high dose steroids might um, help with the, uh, the pneumonitis. Um, and then there was the other um, treatment limbs, so patients are randomized between antiretrovirals, uh, high dose steroids, hydroxychloroquine, and um, monoclonal antibodies. Um, nobody was put on sunshine and bleach, as far as I know. Um, so in terms of the uh, difficult points, difficulties and learning points. Um, so one of the things I reflected was just how important um, your key staff are. So we had an enormous amount of staff in the non-clinical side doing excellent work in, in well-being and uh, learning and so on. Uh, and then in the clinical side, you had very, very, as I say, very educated, very talented people who might be uh, experts in their field and, and, and so on, but actually often what shifts came down to was how many ODPs and how many um, intensive care nurses were available. Uh, and I'm not just saying this because I'm sat next to two intensive care nurses and I work with ODPs every day, um, but they were genuinely the, often the, the most important critical staff in terms of um, keeping the place moving. Um, the other thing I think you realise is an ICU isn't just one ward, it really is the sort of focal point of an entire hospital. And it's incredibly hard to have one without the other. So I think uh, the, all the people, the auxiliary services, the logistics and so on around intensive care, I think it almost surprised everyone, just every sort of additional service you want to put in, just how much uh, you know, auxiliary um, people you need to, to sort of support it. Um, I think infection control was very difficult. Um, if you're wearing PPE all day, for example, for, um, for central lines and so on, without running water, we were putting PPE on top of PPE. And actually, one of the take homes has been there. It was an in increased infection rate for um, central venous access at the um, XL. Although that's a little bit difficult to pick apart because a lot of those lines would have come from other hospitals uh, into, into, the, uh, into the XL. But I do think infection control was tricky between patients. And again, the, the noise in the environment were, 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 um, were hard. Uh, just some positives to finish with. I thought um, I took away the military influence. Uh, it's the first time I've worked um, up close with any kind of military. And I think it, their attitude and their can do and the kind of no nonsense attitude they took was brilliant. And some of the things like having the chevrons on the shoulders that um, Joe mentioned um, for your role, um, 
having very clearly delineated teams was something that would be useful to bring back to my normal clinical practice. And again, um, repetition, the, the teams that were doing proning, that were doing transfers and lines and so on, they became so slick from doing repetition of the same task. Um, they, there was a huge amount of troubleshooting on a day-to-day -day basis. So we had issues of um, changing our SOPs based on um, the availability of equipment. So for example, um, and again, this might be a little bit for people with anesthetic and NICU backgrounds, but a lot of the Dragers were originally on wet circuits, so they'd have inline humidifiers. Um, but we found because of the availability of other pieces of equipment, we needed to make an SOP which could work for every single um, anesthetic machine, Drager, whatever people were being ventilated on um, uh, without any variability, so that it was, it was safer that way. So um, those SOPs would change on a relatively, um, they were changing relatively often. Uh, so that meant versatility in terms of the people writing them and um, distributing that information, but also on the part of uh, the nurses and so on, many of whom hadn't worked in critical care before. Uh, I'm going to just mention the freebies. There was an endless supply of chocolate. I had a huge amount of chocolate. Uh, and finally, um, the success. So I think the success of the, in many ways, the success of the Nightingale is that it wasn't uh, ever needed it in as much as um, the numbers as we thought it may be. I think it's, um, it's a testament to the work, hard work at the many intensive cares throughout London, the smaller DGHs, the, you know, the places that really hit hard, the North Parks, the uh, North Mid and so on, uh, that we were able to stay at the relatively low numbers we were. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'll end on that and uh, come back to Jonathan for some questions and comments uh, through Slido. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Phil. And uh, thanks to all of you, uh, Vicky, Joe, Cap and Phil, that's fantastic. Um, we've got a few questions. We've got five or six minutes to, for questions um, before we're going to have to wrap up, I'm afraid. Um, so it's Slido, uh, hashtag GR2020 for questions. We've probably got enough to be getting on with at the moment, I think. Um, just, a, just a few just themes. So what's happened to the hospital? Do we, is it still open and mothballed or has it been taken apart? I believe it's mothballed. I believe it's still set up, ready to go, should we need it again. Mm -hmm. Um, but there, it's it's been completely closed. There's not been any patients now for well over a month. And do you know what's going to happen? It is ready. Do you know what's going to happen to the resources once the hospital is sort of is closed closed down? Are they going to be reallocated to? Um, well, most of the resources were donated by hospitals across the patch, so I'm assuming that, that people will want their equipment back. I know we donated um, here several ventilators, filters. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm guessing we'll want those back when when they're not being used. Okay, good. And a lot of a lot of people are talking about you know the, the effect of the staff that are there. Um, do you acknowledge has any anybody actually contracted uh, COVID nineteen staff members while they were there? Were you tested for that, or was, has that been monitored? So we were tested um, specifically um, in any kind of staff testing. There were certainly people in our team that caught um, COVID during our time there. But I think that was to be expected. You're always going to have a certain, and we plan for a certain amount of the um, faculty to be sick at any one time because we weren't living in a sterile bubble. Um, you know, we were still interacting with, you know, people outside. We were still going home to our families. Um, so there was, there was an, a, a sickness rate. It wasn't massive. I was amazed, actually, how low it was, um, especially in the education and training team, thinking about the number of people we were bringing through. We were, you know, we were in contact with hundreds of different people every day, um, but we, there was only maybe half a dozen people who got COVID during the process. Um, I don't know if that was any different for the military or in the clinical setting, um, but I, yeah, I was amazed at how few of us got sick. Superhumans, that's why. <laughs> yeah, well, you're using your PPE very well. Yeah. Um, that's good. I mean, it sounds to me also, it sounds to me like the military was very influential on this. And, um, you know, a few things, I mean, and I think Joe, mentioned this thing called moral courage. Um, and certainly it's a phrase that I've not really been um, exposed to in the NHS. I mean, do you think we need to be trained in moral courage in the NHS, Joe? Yeah, absolutely, Jonathan. It's, it's just a really simple way of having that sort of psychological savvy conversation and making it a very natural thing rather than having that stigma that's, that's often attached to mental health. And we've learned the hard way in the army. You know, we haven't always got it right, but I think by, by bringing in things like react training and trim training, getting people to 
to own up really quickly that actually I'm struggling. Um, it really does go a long way. Mm, okay. Um, and I think that, I mean, so we don't, I mean, the army, of course, they, you know, we, we do have a lot of military doctors coming to the NHS for training. Mm -hmm. Do you think there could be a role for going the other way around and some NHS people spending some time at military facilities and getting exposed to your training? Would that help us, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the reserves is, is a great platform for medics that, that want that sort of 50-50, if you like, you know, the, mm -hmm. the exposure to some military things as well as keeping on with their clinical. So, you know, that's a good way in. In terms of going to military hospitals, we don't have any more. You know, we don't have any more. We're, we're very much incorporating our, our military doctor training, nursing training within the NHS. Um, so it's a bit more reliance on that than, than the other way around. But but if anyone's interested in the reserves, I'll do a little bit of um, advertising here and, and please do give me a shout. Yeah, well, I'm sure they could join up. But you don't, you don't think we should bring back national service then so everyone has to join up? Oh God, huge pleasure. Um, <laughs> he had my way, absolutely, but I'm not sure that would go down terribly well. <laughs> no, that's probably a political issue, isn't it? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's good. And Joe, you talked about this improval app, um, which everyone had access to there. Is, is that something that we could look at getting within the NHS or a GOLSH particularly? I, I've never heard of it before. I don't know if you can describe that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, again, 100%, Jonathan, it was absolutely brilliant. It, one, it could track morale. But also it gave that really sort of very quick interaction between those on the shop floor and those that were maintaining it and, and it linked in very well with our quality and learning and it's just simply an app on your phone so you can either ask questions to them and, and get the answers yeah. but equally they can say look there, there's you know for example the you know i feel like i'm ventilating a load of bodies you know what can we do about this and and, and we have that, that that really quick communication and it is something that other nhs trusts are using and I think, you know, it will be well suited to have something like that at Great Ormond Street. Um, it really was excellent at, at capturing that sort of really good communication. And it also fed back almost immediately to people. Yeah. So they knew that you were actually listening and they knew that whether you could do something about it. And if you couldn't, you were very honest with them. And it, but at least they knew that you were listening. So I think it's a, a, an amazing tool. And I'd, I'd love to, to bring that to, to Gosh. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe maybe we should look at that. Look at doing that. And has there been any long term follow up of the staff? I mean, from the point of view of, you know, I mean, this is physically clearly, you know, screening is there for for the mental health issues long term. Um, all the staff at the Nightingale. Are you, are you still in contact? Very much. So. Is, oh, oh, sorry. On, I was going to say there is research going on, and there is follow up. Um, there's there's um, um, so Gabe Reedy out of King's University. He's doing a. He got rapid ethics approval. Um, from King's to do a study around the psychological effect of staff working at the um, at the Nightingale. So there is there is formal work coming out of it as well um, with a proper academic um, from an academic setting. Okay, well that's good. That's good to know. That's fantastic. Um, and have, have you are you keeping a core group working together? So just in case there's a second wave or another pandemic in the future, that we can just reactivate you mm -hmm. uh, to set this up in a quicker time. Uh, from, from our perspective, yes. So we're on, Caroline doesn't know yet, but we're on a, a 48 hour notice to move um, right. in terms of, um, you know, if something happens and London requires such a facility again, then the key personnel. But we're simmering with a lot of activity in the background. It's a lot easier to turn it on when it's at a, a reasonable heat than, than turn from scratch like we had to do um, in the beginning. But, but okay. yes, very much so. Great. Okay. That's fantastic. Well, look, thanks. I think um, sadly we've run out of time. It's, it's gone two o'clock, but a lot of people comment saying fantastic. And, you know, what an insight. I didn't realise that Gosh had such a, actually, had an input. I think everyone's very proud of you and thankful for sharing this insight. Um, and but also they're nice to have you back at Gosh, all of you. Okay. Because we probably need you here with us as well as we do at the Nightingale. Okay. Good. So thank you, team. That is fantastic. Um, I'm sure if there's any other questions, they can get hold of you individually. Um, if there's any, certainly if anyone wants to join up um, with Joe, form a queue outside of her, <laughs> of course, outside of her office, all right, um, uh, in an orderly fashion, and then uh, we can let the army. Um, good. Okay. So close. Thanks to you all. That's fantastic. Uh, we will be uploading the, all the all the um, run rounds onto Gold and then onto the GLA YouTube. Oh, um external facing thing so you can share it with your friends if you want to and a quick plug for next week next week we've got the remote working team and we're talking about how you can re remotely work from a clinical point of view 
as a physician um, and some of the pitfalls and solutions around that at the moment that we are seeing because there's a rapid increase in our remote working clinically from it but that's great so I think that's all over for me it's on to the clock and I'll let everyone get back to work thank you very much everyone that tuned in bye-bye